Hi guys, I hope I can get all this into a single 15 minute video because as DPR quite rightly points out, you can start more fires in 5 minutes than you can extinguish in 15. But my favorite Hamza has once again presented his opinion on embryology in the Quran which he calls new and long awaited. In spite of my preemptive refutation in my Oops Hamza did it again video and he did exactly what I had predicted. In this speech Hamza makes several bold claims such as that the Quran was revealed over 1400 years ago and contains many references to scientific miracles far beyond the knowledge at the time. He still can't make up his mind on when the paper for this is going to be released. Vague ambiguous statements. When exactly was the Quran revealed if it was over 1400 years ago? Years based on sidereal, tropical, synodic or draconic months? What is the definition? Is there a scientifically verifiable date as from when we can take the Quran as having been revealed? The Quran makes no reference to anything, least of all science and it does not mention any verifiable scientific miracle. Hamza here claims that the Quran is not based on the 7th century worldview. How so? Where does it mention anything else? People believe the heavens were held up by mountains which also stabilized the ground. The Quran mentions things like thunder without lightning, a split moon hitting a corpse with a stake raises it, a barrier between salt and sweet water. All things we know today are not true and attributed to superstition at the best of times. The Quran does not mention anything of any practical value we know today, not even a, 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 a bicycle. All we have is a book full of superstitions. Where is the evidence that there is anything in the Quran that was not known at the time? So there is no proof for any of his claims. Hamza was recently schooled by a real life embryologist and no, it was not an interesting discussion and not with someone only claiming to be a professor. When you look at what the Quran says about it, it is vague, it is, be, no, it's not interesting. It's not, it's, it, you're, real, you're really boring. And he told him of what would have to be in the Quran for it to be accurate regarding embryology and what is found in the Quran. What part of it is vague and it is wrong doesn't he understand? Why does he still claim there is some correspondence between the Quran and modern science? So we can see straight away from the beginning there is a some form of correspondence with the statements in the Quran and modern science. <coughs> no Hamza, there isn't. It's only your imagination and make-believe world. The Quran only describes what is the obvious appearance, not the medical processes. What we see here is the typical setting up of false premises. The statements our Mr. Hamza makes are only possible through interpretation, not stating facts. What Hamza does is talk about sentences in the Quran and then mixing this with human interpretations in the Hadiths to give an impression he desires. He also quotes endless embryology books and embryologists, then quickly adding some words from the Quran, making it look as though there is some correspondence. There is not. And no embryologist today or any modern book on embryology mentions any word used in the Quran or even mentions the Quran as it would be a miracle if a book written more than a thousand years ago would contain something corresponding to modern medicine. The Quran, which Muslims consider God's word, in general does not make any hard and cold assertions but only manages some vague and ambiguous statements except when it comes to heaven or hell which are described in great detail. Maybe because we can't measure or check them. I've already shown over a year ago that the Quran contains some stages as can be found in Greek medicine and that Greek medicine resembles the Quran almost word for word. We have some empty promises where here Hamza promises his claims are not based on the statements made by a Canadian anatomist and his function as a paid actor Keith Moore. And then whom does he mention? We'll talk about the 1990s or 1980s view of Keith Moore. For instance, embryologist Keith Moore and T. Moore is supposedly not used at all, but somehow creeps in again. Moore did not speak a word of Arabic, yet his translation <laughs> changes Islamic embryology, which apparently is different from any other or normal embryology. Instead of making some valid points, Hamza now pleads and begs for the special consideration of his book, disregarding any scientific consideration of embryology. It is with pleasure that I see the fabricated lies made up some 40 years ago by a Yemenite Arab being abandoned and ditched bit by bit. Yet 
instead of just accepting the Quran as a religious book, some Muslims stubbornly refuse to let go and still try to put science into this ambiguous and unclear worded religious book. Hamza does this by going from the Quran contains scientific miracles to pleading for understanding that the Quran does not really contradict science, but he botches it. Right, let, me, let me show you how. By far the best sentence I've heard from him, an atheist apologist. You see this from atheist apologist? Claims the Quran copies from Galen. Apologists? Atheist apologists? I have to prove the Quran contains more than postulated by Hippocrates, Aristotle and Galen. I need to defend the inability of theists being unable to provide proof of a God. Wow, is this honest or scientific? I could go on and take every single sentence apart, but the speech is not really worth it. Like all religious books, the Quran has some built-in protective mechanisms designed to act as a safeguard. Produce one like it may have been difficult in the 9th century, but today it is all too easy. Allah, over time, reduced the challenge from an entire book to 10 chapters to one chapter and finally down to something even remotely like it. Did he think initially it would be too difficult and thus had to reduce it in stages, or was he simply bragging and realized it would be sufficient to impress the 7th or 8th century desert nomads? And why didn't he know that over time there would be hundreds of books, chapters and sentences as good as or better than the Quran. But as it stands, if Mr. Hamza has a point, he thinks we are screwed. So let's see what the experts write, the linguists. Well, Ali Dashti, in the famous Iranian Arab scholar in 23 years, writes, neither the Quran's eloquence nor its moral precepts are miraculous. He also quoted Ibrahim on Nazim, who openly acknowledged that the arrangement and syntax of the Quran are not miraculous and that work of equal or greater value could be produced by other God-fearing persons. Websites such as Answering Islam have page after page of examples, as has Surah like it. He has a whole lot of suggestions on how to make a better and more plausible and more correct and more accurate Quran. An interesting discussion can be found on Islamic awareness, where it says that according to Abdel Jabbar, the correct interpretation of Sarfa is the motives to rival the Quran disappeared. Others say it could be possible to produce the Quran, but people stopped doing so, as was expressed by these Arabs. I myself have produced some sentences which are longer than chapter 108, are about what Hamza mentions in this pamphlet on page 8 and makes a lot more sense, as they are not wrong, neither in contents nor in grammar. If we look at Surah 5524, it says he gave you ships that roam the sea like flags. So, if I were a godlike being with an inclination towards science, I would rather say these words are not scattered, are prose and not some prose and some poetry and some neither, as in the Quran. The words are meaningful, non-contradictory, non-vague, and don't consist only of two or three random letters, forming, for example, an, an ad. How come Muslims have missed this sign? But it gets worse, a lot worse, because now we, we hear from Hamza that the Quran would not lie, because Allah would not lie, because it says so in the Quran. Muhammad would also not lie, the usual special pleading. Hamza thinks and is stuck on this that the Quran was transmitted and written down word for word based only on what Muhammad said. No Hamza, there is no proof or evidence that the Quran was written or dictated by Muhammad, no matter what you think or say. Muhammad could not select the truth and reject anything wrong because nothing is there to select. There is no point stating that Muhammad could not have selected only the correct parts. And whatever is in the Quran on embryology is totally, completely and utterly wrong. Live with it. It is much more likely that the Quran was written by several people over a much longer time period. That would explain the many inconsistencies and contradictions. It would also explain all the different stories, fables, folklore, legends, myths and tales which would have been added by different people who also added the individual Moses story. And it would explain how Greek medicine and Hindu or Jewish geology ended up in the Quran. Hamza then explains how the ambiguous Quran can mean anything but will always mean what is correct. And was there anything new in the speech? No. 
Everything has been said before, maybe not in this particular combination. And if we turn to a factual claim on his speech and what he says in his pamphlet, Hamza tells us that man is formed from an essence or extract of clay. This can be found endless times in the Quran, such as in 32.7, which states, Who made all things good which he created, and he began the creation of man from clay. Then he made a seed from a draught of despised fluid. Well, I have at least three problems with these two vague sentences. If Allah made all things he created good or well, why do Muslims chop off parts of humans after birth? Why would seminal fluid be considered dirty, despised or disdained? And began the creation of man from clay. Is, is this only Adam created from clay, all men or all humans? He decides that the God of the Muslims must have been using clay only for Adam. Why? Well, because humans have decided this, not the Quran supposedly revealed by the God itself. Hamza claims this clay scientifically, basically, and first and foremost, means the chemical components. Excuse me? How does he know indisputably what this God means? Why doesn't his God tell us exactly what it means? And what is the definition of man? What is formed? What is essence of clay or an extract of clay? What clay? From what area? By whom? When? How? How many? In what? Are? Does he not know that clay from different geographies is made up of vastly different elements? Does he not know that science will require answers to all those questions? I stopped counting when I reached 20. Counting the medical terms Hamza used to describe the essential components required to describe embryology. The embryology in the real world. Is any of these words mentioned in the Quran? No. Are even the most crucial words or functions mentioned? No. We don't find the term sperm, ovum, fertilization or a zygote. You need to imagine them. Like chromosomes are not mentioned nor are the genes, because we learn from the Hadith that the child will not resemble the father or mother depending on genes, but who has an orgasm first? Superstition, not more. Like in English, the word flat can refer to coke without CO2, a dwelling, a piece of flat ground, a woman without silicone implants, a mood, etc. etc. Can I make up a sentence which has the word flat meaning all of the above? Give it a try. But Mr. Hamza wants us to believe that alaka means clinging, blood clot, leech, and the sentences in the Quran can thus mean what you want and what is correct at any given point in a conversation or discussion. But Captain Disguise has thoroughly debunked the claim regarding alaka. Neither Barry Mitchell nor Ram Sharma ever mention the word leech on any of the 85 pages of their book Embryology. It is not in the glossary or in the index. A search comes up blank. This otherwise very nicely done book only follows modern medicine, describes embryology and never once mentions the Quran, a blood clot, a leech or the word alaka. So Hamza is clearly lying here. They say that the tube-like or leech-like substance is due to longitudinal folding. Because there is no real resemblance between a leech and an embryo, you make drawings, not photos, of something labelled leech and an embryo. But because you need it to comply with certain predefined restrictions, you need to draw it from on top, not the side it is usually shown from. Then you cut off the bottom or 80% of the entire embryo, the yolk sac, and then put the two drawings side by side. Now you declare the 80% unnecessary since the translation of the guy that does not speak Arabic and declare them both to be leech-like. Add the word into some dictionaries and you have a match. Magic. Hamza accuses embryologists, scientists and academics of having a shallow view of embryology in the Quran. I am really beginning to think, who actually cares? Why not wait for a real claim with scientific proof instead of responding to these half-baked apologetics, special pleading and whining? In closing, I just have three short questions. When will Muslims accept that the Quran is a religious book without any useful scientific contents? When will they accept that in the real world it is not a case of science only being right if it agrees with the Quran or a Bible for that matter? When will they accept that no matter how much they twist and turn the words in the Quran around, science is the wrong topic to try this with as it is precise and based on facts? Religion is neither. Thank you for your time.